Hello, Packers fans. Welcome to the Green 19 podcast from JS Online and PackersNews.com. I'm Cassidy Hill, joined as always by Tom Silverstein and Ryan Wood here in Denver, although albeit currently uh, in our respective rooms. And as you can tell from my voice, I've, it's it's um, been a rough weekend. That seems to be par for the course with anything coming out of Green Bay right now. Packers lose 19-17 to the Denver Broncos. It is their third loss in a row. They are 2-4 and four overall, only uh, six games into this season. Still 11 games to go. But, guys, I'm just going to kind of start with a big picture here. I asked A.J. Dillon tonight, asked a lot of players, but we're going to start with A.J. Dillon's quote. Are, are you to a point yet where you're worried about this season getting away from you? And Dylan said, I'm not hitting the panic button. Nobody's hitting the panic button. If you're the Packers, should you be hitting the panic button? Soon? Well, I don't know what panic button there is to hit. You know, I mean, what what does that mean? It means your expectations were that you were going to go to the Super Bowl or something like that. And, man, you better – figure out what's wrong. And, and I think we all kind of know what's wrong. It's not something they can just flip a switch on and fix, you know, they, they need to gradually get better, not get worse. And that's what we're seeing is they're getting worse and, or at least being stagnant. And so like, I don't think there is any, there even is a panic button. I think there's just a, You know, all they have is like one of those switches, a dimmer switch, you know, so they can go a little bit higher or a little bit lower. And today they went a little bit lower. Ryan, I saw you shaking your head there. You agree? I agree very much. And in fact, Spoon, I think you got it right. I think they are getting worse. And I I don't mean they're going to stay getting worse, but I think they are getting worse. Look, this this is a, a defense that they played today. Everyone knows. We all know that they gave up 70 to the Dolphins. They gave up 31 to Zach Wilson in the New York Jets. They gave up 35 to the Washington Commanders. This is the NFL's worst defense, and the Packers' offense made them actually look good. But even the two touchdowns the Packers got today, they're kind of fortunate to get them, you know? And those were till the fourth quarter. It, it, they're, they're getting worse. I think what panic constitutes is not 2023 season. Can I completely agree with Spoon? It was never about the 2023 season. If you thought that this team was going to come in and, and just run rough shot over the NFC, even if it's a bad NFC, it's not the reality of a new starting quarterback, incredibly young offense around them. I, I think panic would be if if you just decide that Jordan Love's not the guy. I think that's early. I, I don't think we know yet. I think there's certainly concern. I, I, I wouldn't call it panic. I would call it concern. I, I think one of the – the more concerning things to me is when you have this, this new starting quarterback around young playmakers who are not ready to put, put it together week after week, there, there is no go-to guy in this Packers offense. And even with Aaron Jones back today, they still didn't look good. We don't know how back Aaron Jones was, but he, he's a running back. There's no go-to target for this new starting quarterback in this offense. And without that, it's got to muddy up the, the evaluation at least a little bit because who, who's who's the blame here? Who, who's the problem? And, and it's a sliding scale. There's plenty of blame to go around to everyone, quarterback receivers, but there, there's just there's no guy for Jordan Love to go to when things get tough. And top quarterbacks in this league, a lot of them have that guy. Jordan Love doesn't. Packers don't. And Jordan Love's not helping the situation. So that that to me is the most worrisome thing. Not having that guy, let me ask this, was that not sort of the plan going into the season? Like, hey, all of these young kids are going to have to grow through this together. And yeah. is is it too early to say that that plan was a bad idea? Or, you know, do you wait and kind of see what this group can do if they can eventually gel together? Well, I don't. I'm a little bit torn because I, I think a guy like Romeo Dobbs is is to me is as close to a veteran 
as you'll have. I mean, he's he's a smart guy from the beginning. He knows how to get open. He doesn't blow routes. You know, um, Christian Watson, even though, you know, he didn't play the whole year, he's had a whole year under his belt. The second year should be a lot better. You know, there shouldn't be a ton of errors now. You might not see all the great plays, but there shouldn't be a ton of errors. Um, Jaden Reed is as mature a rookie as you'll find. And from what I can tell, you don't see a ton of errors. What you just don't see is continuity is, is like chemistry between all of them. And I don't know if that's starting with Jordan Love, if that's starting with um, LaFleur's play calling with the, the offensive scheme or what, but something's missing. And I don't think they should be as bad as they are. I just, I, I don't want to put that at the feet of youth and inexperience because they can be, they can be better than that. Um, I, they just got something wrong. There's something wrong with their offense. While we're still looking at this as a big picture, then let me ask you this. Um, do you think it's time to start asking, and, and this, this could be a dumb question, so feel free to tell me if it is. Is it time to start asking if LaFleur should hand over play calling duties and, and let himself focus more fully on other responsibilities of a head coach? I and just don't think that's going to happen. I mean, I, I just don't, I don't foresee that happening. I don't know who he'd hand it over to. Um, you know, the idea when Matt LaFleur lost Nathaniel Hackett, uh, and, and they had Nathaniel Hackett, may, maybe as an, an, op, uh, an option, but the idea was promote Adam Stenovich, who'd done a tremendous job as the offensive line coach, as the run game coordinator, because Matt LaFleur's history in this league has always been geared toward quarterbacks, which means geared toward the passing game. So you'd have this marriage between Matt LaFleur and his passing background and Adam Stinovich offensive line running background, and there'd be symmetry there. That was the idea. I, I don't know that I see Adam Stinovich as a play caller. He's never done it before. He's, he's relatively new to offensive coordinator still. I just and, and beyond that, I would just would be shocked if, if Matt Lafleur was willing to do that. I, if I were Matt Lafleur, I would try to find somebody who's out there, a veteran type guy who can come in and do some analysis on what, what they're lacking. You know, the Eagles brought in Vic Fangio last year um, just to look over stuff. You know. Um, the Broncos have had um, Tom Capers, and you know the Vikings had him the year before. Uh, there, there's some use to having those type of guys around to kind of give you a um, an opinion of, you know, a big picture look at what's going on. And I think he's got a young staff, and I think he needs some help. I I don't think it's necessarily the play calling specifically. I think it's the game planning. I mean, they're coming out and they're not attacking whatever it is the other team's weakness is. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything that you go, oh, that's that's a really good start for their game. You know, they're, they really got it clicking. Um, there's just nothing that says to you, oh, oh, man, they got it. They figured it out. And, you know, you see it in the clutch. Um, you know, Denver did. Denver did when they got down, you know, in the Packers territory and Sean Payton set up a play where if it's man coverage, you know, he, he sends Cortland Sutton in motion. And if Rasul Douglas follows him, they know it's man coverage and they run a certain play and it was perfect. And it was a touchdown. And if Douglas stayed where he was, then they were going to run a zone play, you know, and it wouldn't have been the same play. But that's the kind of stuff where you just like that, that was done during the week. You know, they, they know that stuff. And, and I just don't see that quite as, uh, you know, I don't see them coming out that way. I, I think even more than that, and I've said this before, 
I think this offensive coaching staff is searching a lot right now. And the proof of that is how much their game plans and what they're trying to accomplish fluctuates week to week. I mean, look what they were trying to do against the Raiders. Matt LaFleur said it. They wanted to go downhill run. They wanted to get Jordan Love on the perimeter. Well, how did they come out today? They, they come out today seemingly wanting to get Jordan Love's efficiency up. Completion percentage last in the league, wanting to make things easier on him, which meant quick passing game and just just really thinking and dunking. And he completed ten of his first thirteen passes. I think he was what was he twenty of twenty eight on the day, something like that. He was around seventy percent. Twenty one thirty one. Uh, but he 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 averaged three point six yards in those first thirteen passes. That's not going to win in this league. That that's anemic, and then in the second half, they they Matt Lafleur said in the post game, they got more some some more aggressive plays in, in the passing game, which is totally different than how they came out in the first half. So it's just it's just fluctuated so much, and it's almost kind of like wapable right now. They're just trying to just trying to get the mold. I mean, they're, they're 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 just trying to figure out what it is, and I don't think they know right. now. Speaking of the differences in the first half and the second half, this goes along with what both of you were saying, but like you always hear about, especially on offense, if there's nothing else you have planned, you have your first 15 plays planned. That that doesn't look to have – this team doesn't look to have any scripted plays in their first 15 plays. Like they just look disjointed, disconnected, a little fumbling at least. What is it, in y'all's opinions, do you think that is – changing between the first half and the second half? Well, you know, they, they make some adjustments at halftime. Um, you know, apparently some of those are working. I, I, I really don't know. You know what? I don't have an answer for that. I don't know why all of a sudden they're able to, to move the ball a little bit in the second half. It seems like their opening drives in the second half are usually pretty good. But why that is, I don't know. And they don't seem to be able to, re, you know, sustain it all that much. You know, they were, okay, so they got, you know, 17 points or whatever it was. It's not enough. Even even when you get shut out in the first half, they, they needed to be way more prolific. And they're not. I, I don't know why it's better in the second half. I've never thought that they're just a great team at adjusting. Um, they need to figure out how to start faster. Yeah, I don't know either. But I think we should underscore just how anemic they've been in the first half. Okay. They've been over 133 first half minutes since they had their last first half touchdown. That's stunning. It's it today. It's been 35 days today. They're, by their next game, it'll have been 42 days since they've had a first half touchdown. Was they, it versus they, the Bears? Week two. Do you remember what their last first half touchdown was? Uh, was that the one to Jaden Reed? It was the Jaden Reed jet pass. Yeah. In, in Atlanta, they haven't had a first half touchdown since then. The, their last four first halves: zero points, three points, three points. Zero points. You will not win in this league doing that. It's impossible. You will not win in this league doing that. They've won one. They, they won one because they had a near miraculous comeback, and it was near miraculous because that they put themselves in that position. I, I, it, it was a few weeks ago that Rasul Douglas told me, told me we we can't keep digging into holes like this. We, we we can't keep falling behind the eight ball week after week. It's not sustainable. And he's right. It's not sustainable what they're doing in the first half. So, you know, and I asked Jordan Love today, his frustration – first of all, I asked him, how high is your frustration level? Because let's remember that first press conference after Aaron Rodgers was traded. He comes out and says, and he's right, he knows it's not going to be perfect his first year. He knows that the season is going to have ups and downs, and they found a down. They are in a downtime right now. So I asked him how frustrated he is. And yeah, they're, they're real frustrated because – they keep, they keep it's like Groundhog Day. They keep having winnable games come up short. And this is another winnable game. They lost by two, two weeks ago against Las Vegas. That was a winnable game. 
they keep having winnable games come up short at the end. I, I asked, what, what's that? What's missing there? Why is that? Like, what, what's the missing ingredient? And he point, pointed directly to the first half. They, they, they can't keep coming out like this. It's just, it's stunning, stunning how anemic they've been in the first half. Speaking of Russell Douglas and, and the difference in the first half and the second half, let me just read y'all this quote he had tonight. I don't know what we think we are, but I guess we're just supposed to be some miracle second half team, space jam, everybody drink the juice or whatever and just win. And that shit's mm-hmm. not the NFL. You're not doing that. So you got to come out and we got to do whatever we're doing in the second half in the first half and then repeat that again in the second half. And once we do that, we'll be good. Is it, I mean, is that as simple as it is? Like, oh, cool. do you think it's, do you, it seems like in the second half, too, there's more of a sense of urgency. Do you think that it's like a mindset thing? Like, they're it's almost like they're tricking themselves, like, oh, okay, dang, now we're down by 10 points. We've got to, you know, manufacture some sort of comeback. And, and is there any way is, – is that on the coaches? Is that on the players to – manufacture that mindset from the beginning of the game? I don't know. I don't know if mindset has anything to do with it, if it's urgency. I mean, I think we need to get to, um, you know, the guy who handles the ball the most, and that's Jordan Love, and talk about what's going on for him and um, first half versus second half. And I think you know, we may be finding that he's a slow starter, that it takes him a while to, you know, really get confident and get into what he wants to, um, what he's seeing out in the field. I don't know. Um, today it was just so disjointed. You know, when when they had a good play called, the line didn't block. When... Um, Love needed to go through his progressions and find a a check down. He threw it first progression, you know, first read. It's just like everything was off. And, you know, at some point the quarterback has to be the guy who brings it all together. And he's not doing that. That's Mm -hmm. just not who he is right now. It doesn't mean it won't happen, but it's not happening for him. And and they got to figure out why. Let's talk about Jordan Love, first half versus second half, and overall today as well. In the first half, Love went uh, 10 of 13 for 47 yards. In the second half, he went 11 of 18 for 133 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. We'll get to the interception in a minute there. And and so to your point, yeah, like there's there's a difference in Love, too, from that first half to the second half. Um, But it's not like he was great in the second half. It's not like he was just tearing it up and and they were, you know, they they grounded out on the ground a little bit. They got really lucky on two touchdowns that easily could have gone the other way. And, you know, they might have ended up with field goals instead of touchdowns. So there was a lot of luck involved there or, or, you know, give Romeo Dobbs some, some credit. But the way he loved through that ball, it, it had every right to be picked off. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just, to me, I don't walk away from that second half going, well, they kind of solved, you know, their problems. I, I think they they figured out a way to move the ball on the ground a little bit better. He hit one or two finally, you know, hit a couple of plays, and then they were very fortunate in the red zone. Before we get to the interception, let's go over the two touchdowns because I know there were questions about both of those. Actually, well, the second one, there wasn't a question about it. They just got really, really lucky that, um, you know, Romeo Dobbs popped it up and Jaden Reed came down with it and not a Broncos player. The first touchdown, though, the one to Romeo Dobbs, as you said, give credit to Romeo Dobbs. He came down with it and muscled it for the catch. The question, according apparently those who watched the broadcast, said that, that um, there was a question as to, whether it should have gone to Sertan as an interception. Spoon, I know there was a pull report with the official after the game. 
I always thought that a 50-50 ball tie goes to the receiver. Is that essentially what the official was saying? What, take us through what the official said, explaining how that was called a touchdown. Um, they, they ruled that Dobbs had possession of it first and came down with it with Sertan on him. So they said that they felt that Dobbs had the possession first. Um, a lot of people thought Sertan had the possession first. Uh, New York reviewed it and upheld the call. I, I'm interested to see tomorrow on Monday whether the NFL comes out and says, well, we kind of made a mistake. You know, yeah. the rule is that the first guy with his feet down and has possession is, is a I don't know. I mean, Gene Steratore is not an idiot. He's He was a, a referee for a long time. And so for him to say that, um, you know, there's so, got to be some validity to it. So I'm very interested to see how the league rules. You know, they always send a memo and say, oops, we made a mistake. <laughs> of course, we can't turn it around. So I don't know. It, it was a great play by Dobbs. But it didn't need to be. He, he was open. I mean, he was right. Open by one and love cannot. I don't know if it's a mental thing or what, but he cannot put it over anyone's shoulder. He just can't do it, and I don't know why. Mm. That leads us into the interception. Uh, this is now a couple weeks in a row. I'm trying to remember how Atlanta ended too, but definitely Raiders and then today versus Broncos, where any chance of a Packers comeback ended with a Jordan Love interception. Uh, this one versus Denver was a, a deep shot to Samori Torre. It was a third and 20 because they had gotten backed up because of a holding call. Um, but the, there was still time, and it felt like they were trying to get it all back in one play. And Matt LaFleur took the blame for that after the game, said, you know, I should have, you know, maybe called something different and tried to get back half of it and then gone for it on fourth down. But Jordan Love also admitted to it not seeing the safety. Ryan, I know you kind of broke down into that play a little bit more. What, what did you learn from what Jordan Love said, what Samari Torrey said, what Matt LaFleur said about that throw and interception? Did I he? think you're starting to see two trends emerge with Jordan Love that are, in one hand, emblematic of young quarterbacks, but two, concerning. Um, and you saw both on that interception. First, impatience late in games. Second straight game that Jordan Love has had an opportunity to extend the game and instead put the game on one throw. It, it, it was very similar to the end of the Raiders game. The last two losses have ended on Jordan Love interceptions. He targets Christian Watson in the end zone when he's got nothing but green grass in front of him and plenty of time on the clock in, in Las Vegas. This one, the, the right place to go with that football was checking it down to A.J. Dillon in the left uh, the, the left flat, uh, the, the way that the, the Broncos were set up with two deep safeties, they the Packers had trips on the left side. They had Jaden Reed on the outside of that trips running a 20-yard over route. They had Samari Torre in the slot running what, what they call a tornado route, which is basically a vertical line across the field, deep vertical across the field. And then they had Tucker Kraft as the one kind of – option other than A.J. Dillon to try to, like, fight and play for – for live for fourth down. But but that got – he ran a 10-yard deep sit route, and, and that got taken away. And Jordan Love saw the the, the, the double on, on Tucker Craft and decided to try to hit Samari Torrey deep without ever seeing that the, – the expectation the Packers had was that the backside safety, which was P.J. Locke, would take the deep over, but he disregarded the deep over and took the uh, the tornado route. Now, if if he's seeing the safety, this PJ Locke was in position to really kind of play both routes, and and that's that. So the lack of patience at the end put it on one throw, but then not seeing the safety, not getting through his progressions, is, is another problem because if he'd gotten through his progressions, he sees nobody's around AJ Dillon. He's got a good at least 10, probably longer gain out of it. And it's, it's a fourth manageable situation. You play for the next down, you live for the next down. Uh, so field vision, I mean, not, not seeing the safety, not re going through the progressions, 
those are two things that Jordan Love's going to have to work on. That was something that I remember us like not praising him for, but noting during the preseason. So do you think that was just softer defenses or do you think this is a regression? What's the other thing we said in the preseason? Once these defenses have film on Jordan Love and can scheme him, it's going to be a whole different ball game. In the preseason, it's vanilla. It's a lot simpler. But you're seeing teams scheme Jordan Love now, and it's different. And so the film is out. They're, they're going to have to adjust to that. Um, I don't know if this necessarily made a difference, so I want to get your two's opinion. Your two's – yours opinions. Good thing I don't work in words. Um. At one point today, Josh Myers was hurt, and he had to come out of the game. And Zach Tom moved to center. Josh Nyman came in. Is that what should have been happening the whole time? Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think Myers had a bad game. Every time I saw him, he was he was busting his butt. Um, I thought he, at least the times I'll have to go back and look at it more closely, but I thought he was playing pretty physical. I think the the move they might have to consider um, maybe moving Zach Tom to left tackle and seeing whether that makes a difference because Rasheed Walker has ups and downs. And right now I think he's probably the least consistent guy in the offensive line. And you know, they can, they can put nine minute right tackle. They can try to work Luke Tenuto, whenever he's ready. I think he's ready. I think he's been practicing. Um, and, and figure that out. But right now, you know, Tom is probably their best pass blocker. Um, and I, I think he just provides more consistency over on that side. I think there's too much pressure coming from over there. So, um that, that's what I would do. I don't think Myers is the problem, in my opinion. I don't think he's if a only, problem. I just don't know if he's the best answer. If only they had a veteran tackle on the sideline who's played a lot of football for this team, most of it at a pretty high level, that they could get on the field to accommodate that. Oh, yeah, Yash Nyman. Yeah. I, I thought you were right. – I was yeah, trying to at, at either tackle. If you want to keep Zach Tom at right tackle and just have minimal change to the offensive line, which most coaches want to do because minimal change is good, try him at left tackle. If not, if you want to switch more, move Zach Tom to left tackle, try Josh Nyman at right tackle. I understand that, I mean, one, he was never given a real opportunity to win the job at a training camp. There's probably reasons for that. I understand that he's fallen off the radar, and there's reasons for that. But this team is 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 getting worse. It's regressing. It's, it's re- regressing, and we've seen Josh Nyman play pretty good football for them. They give him a second round tender this offseason for a reason. So I don't think it's the worst idea to see if uh, if that can help. Mm. Um. I think we did see – I'm trying to – let me see if I can pull up A.J. Dillon's stats. I thought we saw one of Dillon's best games this season. I don't know how much of that you put on the offensive line versus Dillon. He had 15 carries for 61 yards, 4.1 average per carry. Aaron Jones had eight for 35. But Jones also had three catches for 22 yards. Um, it is – for as much as we've talked about different things this offense is going to have to do and lean on – do you see them leaning even more if Aaron Jones is back to 100%, which I asked him after the game, and he said, you know, not maybe maybe not quite 100%, but enough that I could push through it and play today. Do you see them leaning even more and more heavily on those two guys over the next few weeks? Well, Aaron Jones, as he gets healthier, would be the focal point of my offense if, if I'm them. And – I mean, they need to get him the ball. Ball needs to be in his hand as many times as possible. Um, you know, and they did try to do it in the screen game. You know, they he was wide open on the um, 
fade to Romeo Dobbs. They had a screen all set up with him. You know, but the problem is their screens suck. You know, they've been so bad that I think Jordan Love just assumed that it wasn't going to be open. And so he said, well, I got Dobbs on the outside. I'll just take that one. And this one time it it happened to be open. Um, You know, I I just think everything has to go through Jones. Now, it doesn't mean he has to carry the ball 30 times. But, I mean, he should be – you should be game planning for him, getting him into different ways, and then complimenting him with with Dylan. I think Dylan is better when Jones is around. I just think that it is. I think he plays harder, and I think he – for whatever reason, seems to to find holes better, and um, it, it just helps him to have Aaron Jones around. I he thought can help a lot of them have Aaron Jones around. I thought AJ Dillon's best game of the season was today. I thought that was pretty definitive. But I want to temper everything the Packers were able to do on the ground today because they were playing the Broncos. The Broncos entered today as the NFL's worst rushing defense, and it was not close. They entered today giving up on average 167.3 yards on the ground per game. That's last in the NFL. 31 in the NFL is the Carolina Panthers, 144.3. 23 yards better than the Broncos. If you can't run on the Denver Broncos defense, you cannot run because everyone runs on the Denver Broncos defense, literally everyone. So – I don't know if there's much to build on. I, 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 it feels more like an anomaly to me than the start of something uh, because the Broncos defense just so, it's so bad at stopping the run. That's a very fair point. So that's, yeah, something to keep in mind. We'll see what they do next week versus the Minnesota Vikings in the division game at that. Uh, can we move on to defense? Or is there anything else on offense y'all want to go over? Um, I, I want to talk about how the Packers use Luke Musgrave. Okay, I, I let's, let's talk about how the Packers use Luke Musgrave. Yeah. When's the last time you saw him run a, uh, a route down the middle of the field? When have you seen him run? When's the last time you've seen him run a, you know, a corner route or deep over or um, even just a, a go route that, they used to use with Tanya or um, other guys. I, I thought this guy was supposed to be the fastest tight end they've ever had. And all you see him are on these plays in the flat, and he's not very good after the catch. He's just not strong enough in his legs yet. He will be, but I, I don't understand how they're using him. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. I've got the numbers for you, Spoon. Today he's got four four catches for 30 yards. That's seven and a half yards per catch. On the season now, he's got 22 catches for 189 yards. That's less than eight and a half yards per catch. That, it that's, is. Not no, that, that's not horrible. for. That's typical for a lot of tight ends. There are tight ends in the league that that's what they do. And even – you know, um, Hawkinson was like that for a little while. But this guy should be having at least, you know, some balls thrown to him down the seam. When, when I, the last time we, we saw that, wasn't that the one where he kind of messed up his route and fell down? I don't there know might be something thinking. about that. I you mean, because he, he, he's done that a couple times. and Yeah. It's, he hasn't yeah. ran the right route. Uh, but so maybe the, like the coaches don't trust him. Well, then what the heck did they draft him for? Right. And, and to they- your point, Spoon, okay, you don't trust him to run a, a, a complicated route tree. Fine. That's he's not a good route just, tree. But I'm just, you know, from a tight end, you're just running down the seat. Right. Oh, well, that was my next point. Like, okay, fine. You don't trust him to run a super complex route tree. He's still fast. Just send him on a go route, you know. Send him downfield on a simple post or something like, yeah. I, I don't, I don't really understand it. 
I think my, point with those num- my point with those numbers was not that it's bad so much as it's not indicative of, stra- of, of running seam routes. It's a lot of underneath stuff that he's catching right now. I think the numbers reflect that. I don't know what his longest catch is, but – I wonder what his average depth of target is. Yeah, and, and his yards after the catch up would be terrible. He does have a 37-yarder. I think that was probably the Chicago game week one, right? Where he's wide, he was wide open. Yeah, he was yeah, wide open. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so, still, other than that, he should have scored. He should have scored. And is that the one where he fell down as he caught it? Yeah. There's a, yeah, yeah. He, he kind of fell on his butt. I feel like other than that, his longest game. catch is 18 yards today. He's He hasn't had another 20 yard catch this season. If they had drafted uh, Sam Laporta, he'd be their number one receiver right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he he'd he'd probably be their leading receiver. I would bet. I feel like we saw this from Luke Musgrave in training camp. Like, like I, I maybe I'm just having some revisionist history, but like I'm not surprised that this is kind of where he's at right now, six games in, because he had, at least in my opinion, a wildly inconsistent training camp. Like, he would have a day where he caught everything that came his way. He would beat anybody off the line and get downfield. And then he had days where he couldn't catch water falling out of a boat. Like, he just – he had these up and down days that he couldn't string anything together. And you have to remember, too, he coming into this year, he had not played football in a long time because he was hurt really, really early on in his senior year. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that has something to do with it. I'm not sure that coupled with – you know, just the learning curve coming from Oregon State to the NFL. But, again, to your point, Spoon, they used a second-round draft pick on this guy. And so you, you got to get something out of him earlier on than this. So, now can we move on to defense? Sure. Okay. Defense, let's talk about that. Um, this defense is has kind of had, like, you know, a, a bend-don't-break production the past couple of weeks. And when you look at just the defensive side of it, at least – from in my opinion, it looks like it's enough to win these games. They're not getting help from the offense, but because of that, it does feel like it's going to have to just be maybe on the defense to win these games, as Jair Alexander has said a couple of different times. Speaking of Jair Alexander, he didn't play versus the Broncos. Like that back injury seemed to flare back up in practice last week. In his place, Carrington Valentine played very few times. Do I think we say? And, and this may be slightly hyperbolic, but very few times I feel like we can legitimately say if that person had been on the field today, that game might would have gone a lot different. But if Jair Alexander had been on the field today, I feel like this game would have gone a lot different. By my notes, Carrington Valentine got seven balls thrown his way. He gave up six catches for 88 yards. That's um, not a good day at the office at all. And, and, Eric Stokes only played one play. It was punt coverage. And it was this was his first time back since November of last year with that foot injury. And then he went to the sideline after that punt coverage play and, and had to spend the rest of the game with an ice pack on his leg. This team is is this defense, at least on Sunday versus Denver, was desperate, desperate, desperate for some more experience in that secondary. Um is that the answer that like you know Jair Alexander might would have made a difference today but is that gonna fix this team moving forward or or is it is it fair to say the defense is gonna have to take over these games and win these games if this this team wants any chance moving forward well I don't know if they build it oh go ahead go ahead I think we should look into what the definition is of taking over games because on the scoreboard it's it's the second straight week, second straight game that they've held an opponent under 20. And for the longest time here in Green Bay, that's winning defense. I mean, this is Aaron Rodgers 2016. That's more than enough, right? But that's just – it's a different story now. What they failed to do all day was make a play. The Broncos entered tied for fourth in the league in giveaways with 11 this season. They didn't, have, they didn't force a single turnover. This, especially with this offense the way it is now, th- this was a game that was begging for this defense to make a play to, to cause a turnover against the Broncos team that 
is inept at taking care of the ball, and they just couldn't do it. So, it, you know, Jair Alexander said after the Raiders lost that this defense, if it's being self-critical, cannot have, a, allow the opponent to get in the end zone. They only did that once. That's that's pretty good. Pretty good day in terms of points. Scoring defense is obvious. That's that's his it's the point of the game. It's the bottom line. It's the most important stat. But if they're being self-critical of their of their defense, they they got to start making game-changing plays. They've got to start taking the ball away. They, they they've they've got to they've got to stem the momentum better than they've done. Yeah, and let's not get too excited about what they've done. Let's let's look at who they've played. You know, in New Orleans, you know they were getting beat until Derek Carr got hurt, and then Jameis Winston came in. They shut him down. You know, Raiders. Jimmy Garoppolo was not spectacular. I mean, they they did a good job of shutting down the two guys that they needed to. But let's face it, that wasn't like. Um, you know, facing Jalen Hurts. Um, and then today they're facing Russell Wilson, who's semi-washed up and really not that great. And, you know, so they face Kirk Cousins next week. And Kirk Cousins can throw. I mean, he's without Justin Jefferson, so that hurts. But, you know, they're going to face some quarterbacks in the coming weeks that could really – will be – will be a bigger test than the guys they faced. And they continue to give up too many yards on the ground too. You know, I, I forgot what the number was. I think they gave it's like almost 145. Yeah, 145 on 25. They gave up 5.8 yards per carry. So I'm not too excited about the defense, I, even if they're holding them to that number of points. Um, they got to – like Ryan said, they got to make some plays too when when the time calls for it. Let me tell you what else they did. They gave up three first downs on third down by penalty. Yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. killer. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they 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 gave up. You know, a, a deciding fat point in this game was the end of the first half. Where and I'm sure we'll get to it later. Where, where Anders Carlson misses a. 43 yard field goal. Mm -hmm. And right. instead of getting into halftime, they let Russell Wilson get him. It's, it's a six nothing game at this point. Yeah. They're within one possession and they're getting the ball to start the third quarter. Instead of getting the halftime, they let Russell Wilson get him back in field goal position. So instead of getting the three points to cut six, three, it becomes nine, nothing two possession deficit. That is a point right there where mm -hmm. your defense, they didn't let him in the end zone. Fine. Your defense cannot give up points with in the side of the final minute of that first half. They just can't do it. Yeah, that's a six point swing in a two point game. Yeah. And it, let's jump ahead to Anders real quick. That's the first field goal he's missed this season. There was very little wind. Um, yeah. it, it, did you happen to see the operation on that spoon? Was it clean? I didn't, and I didn't get a chance to talk to him. I wanted to ask him about it, but I didn't get it. Because his next field goal, he hit it, but the snap was low. And so I was wondering if on that one that he missed, if that was the case as well. Like, was yeah, I don't know. But, you know, he's going to miss at some point. Everyone does. It was untimely. It <laughs> turned out to be the yeah. difference in the game. But, you know, I, it's going to happen. Um, th That being said, let's – I guess go back to the defense. As you said, they kind of gave up that field goal. Um, it, it, one of the guys after the game tonight said, it doesn't matter how terrible the offense plays in the first half. If they give us a chance to win in the second half in a one-point game, we've got to get off the grass. We can't let them convert that third down and go down there and kick a field goal to win that game. And so that kind of, I guess, just goes back to the point. Like, you've got defense – you've got defense playing – Bend, not break, but you don't have anybody making a play when they need to make a play. And for a defense that has this many, quote unquote, stars on it, there should be somebody making a play. I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. And well, you know, injuries starting to, to creep in a little bit. Of course, not having Jar Alexander. Savage got hurt. Um, you know, they've been without Campbell. But but other other than that, you know, 
McDuffie's played really well, I think, mm -hmm. um, giving them everything they could. Their defensive front's been fine. Um, they just they they don't they aren't special in any way. There's nothing special other than maybe Deshaun Gary and and usually Kenny Clark, although he wasn't much of a factor today. Hmm. That's um that's a that's a damning statement for a defense that's got eight first rounders. They're not special. Right. Yeah. It shouldn't be hard for this defense to be able to make plays with all the assets that the team building assets on that side of the ball. It sh it should 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 not be a lot to ask. You mentioned the injuries. There may be nothing to this, and I kind of want to look at the entire NFL to see if there's a trend. But does this feel like a lot of soft tissue issues? Like a lot of hamstring injuries. I mean, I know covering this team it was for as long as I have, it's always been there's a um, a uh, injury of the year, you know, and it's always hamstring. <laughs> so it's MCLs or you know, shoulder injuries. <clears throat> um, Last year it was ACLs. Yeah, and, and every time I look in the NFL, I'm like, oh, man, that team's beat up. Or, you know, Christian McCaffrey can't stay healthy. He sucks, you know. I mean, like, are you kidding me? You know, it's a violent game and there's a lot of injuries. Um, <laughs> the deepest teams, the luckiest teams, you know, survive. The thing with the Packers is that they don't suffer – they haven't suffered long-term injuries. You know, they haven't – how many season-ending injuries that they had? Bakhtiari's really probably – oh, and Tyler Davis. Um, I'm not sure if there's anybody else I'm forgetting. Um, their injuries seem to be always like a couple of weeks, and then they kind of linger. I don't – I don't know. I – I think that's kind of how the NFL works. I don't think that's too different in a lot of other places. I'm sure it's just in a vacuum, you know. But they do have a ton of injuries now. And going into this Minnesota game, I mean, let's go through it. Eric Stokes. Um, Darnell Savage. Darnell Savage. Luke Musgrave. Luke Musgrave. And Christian Watson, that did not look good to me, that yeah. injury. He was in a lot of pain, too. Um, I don't know how bad that could be. Um, Devontae Campbell. De Devontae Campbell. Uh, Devontae Wyatt. You know, yeah. hurt his knee. He was on the injury report with the knee injury, and now he's re-injured that. I think I said Stokes already. You did say Stokes. Um, uh, Jaden Reed back. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, who knows? Josh Myers. I mean, I, who knows what condition he'll be in on Monday. Um, so they, they got, you know, they're pretty banged up. Yeah. Yeah. And they have already had their bye to get healthy. Right. right. Yep. Aaron Jones said he's not a hundred percent Jair Alexander. So yeah, not a good time to uh, get banged up even more guys. Now they head back home. They four of their first six games were on the road. And so probably very happy to to get back home now as well. Um, and then they will head back out on the road to face Steelers and then the Lions. So uh, not not exactly, as Pete Doherty said it earlier tonight, not exactly a murderer's row here. They should be able to navigate this. But they should have been able to navigate the past three or four games as well. And we've seen how they've come out of it now sitting here at two and four through week seven. If you're the Packers, is this week about fixing your game plan? Is it about getting guys healthy? Is it about focusing on yourself to maybe simplifying things? What, what's what's your priority number one? Figuring out how to win a game. You know, three <laughs> straight losses probably could have been four. Really, that's what it is. Figuring out, okay. You know, you're not going to fix the offense in one week. You're, you know, you, you have to figure out what can you do to um, manage mistakes, manage turnovers, and somehow kick five field goals or something like that. You know, whatever it takes, you got to win. You got to win a game. 
that's really important. Mm. Ryan? I, that's what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> they feel like the, I feel like they're in a free fall right now, just like they were a year ago when they got in that five game losing streak. And it just seemed like there was no bottom to it. It's kind of starting to feel that way. There's no, then feel like there's a bottom to this second straight year, incredibly different team. That team was old. This team is young, but same situation. And here come the Minnesota Vikings. We can talk all we want about the Packers injuries. Minnesota Vikings are, are they don't have Justin Jefferson changes their entire team into Lambeau field. If they don't find a way to win this next game, it, it, it could be a while. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> there might not be a bottom for some time. So yeah, they, they, they've got to stem the tide and it starts now, but you know, they should, they, I think they should have at least lit Raiders Broncos. Those are two bad football teams. I don't care where they play on the road in Neptune. I don't care where they play. Those are two bad football teams. To, to lose both of them, that, that hurts. One thing I will say about this season is that, um, you know, there's people who are like, well, you know, see, they shouldn't have gotten rid of Aaron Rodgers. Well, Aaron Rodgers would not be able to take this. He, he might have somehow managed to get them into the playoffs. But where are they going? You know, where are they really going with him? Who knows if he even made it through the season healthy? Yeah. So they're in the process of moving on from him. And it's ugly. Right now, it's ugly. They think they've picked the right guy in Jordan Love to lead them into the next, you know, into the future. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. But this season has to play out in order for them to figure that out. And, I mean, they need to help him more than they have, but he's going to have to fly on his own too. And so this is this is the process of moving on from a Hall of Famer. This is the process the Chicago Bears went through every season for how many years? You know, it's, it's the process that teams who haven't had back-to-back -back Hall of Fame quarterbacks <laughs> have to go through to, to get it right. You know, Spoon, you 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 wrote about, um, and I, th I think because I, I haven't read your column yet, but you, you wrote about kind of what I was thinking. Uh, I was standing outside the locker room uh, at Mile High, which is the the Packers are seeing now just how dramatically important a quarterback is. Because in this league, most games are close. A lot of this is a league of parity. A lot of games come down to the wire. And when a game comes down to the wire, oftentimes, I mean, by, by far, it's so outweighed. The biggest influencer on that is the guy with the ball in his hand every play, both sides of the ball. That's why I've, and I've said it for years. Wins are a quarterback stat. And this is why. And you're seeing it now because these games often, very often, regularly go down to the wire. And that means the guy at the end of the game with the ball in his hand Making a play or not making a play. That's how games are decided in this league. It's how it's all it's, – it's been like that for years. So the Packers are seeing that right now. What does Matt LaFleur say all the time when he talks about injuries? Like, no one else cares. So, like y'all said, you've got 31 other teams that are probably looking at them right now going, welcome to the real world, folks. Yep. Welcome to the real world. Welcome this, to the outhouse. Yeah, this is what it's like. Join us. Join us. Um. We will head back to Green Bay due to flights. None of us will actually be there for Metal Floor on Monday, but we will still have you covered for it some way, shape, form, or fashion. And <laughs> Spoon was like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> um, but we will also have full wrap-up coverage for you from Denver, uh, continuing on PackersNews.com over the next couple of days and then getting ready to head into a game with the Minnesota Vikings, only their second division game of the year and uh, one that could end up being very, very important as the season goes on. So guys, I will give you each your final 60 seconds. Ryan, you get to go first tonight. Oh, I don't know if I have much else to add. Um, just think that this is, uh, you know, the soft, the soft spot in their schedule is 
Oh, not quite, but almost entirely behind them. And they're two and four in that. If they were going to make any noise in 2023, I don't know that it included a two and four start. So this, this is, but to what Spoon said, you have to let it play out. It'd be so much easier if we had a crystal ball because we have to make these, these, we have to give this analysis based on what we see. We don't know the future holds. And right now it looks bad. Be so much easier if they if we just had a crystal ball. We saw how what what the conclusion was because either they will get better, and this this will be a promising season, or they won't, and it's going to be a tumultuous off season. It's one or the two, and we don't know what it is yet, but it's one of the two. So I, I think it's important to keep in mind we don't have a crystal ball. We have to let it play out, but it, it's it, it it's a hard time for them right now. No crystal ball. I do think I'm going to take a very, very tiny victory lap. I think I got the closest in our predictions. I said Broncos 17, Packers 12. No, right. Who 19. picked the Raiders last week? Do what? Who picked the Raiders two weeks ago? Did you pick the Raiders? Yeah. I did I pick the Packers? I can't remember. It all, it all blurs together. Um, Spoon, anything, any final thoughts? No, I think I gave them um... – my uh, love spiel. So. On your love spiel? Mm hmm Any non-football final thoughts? Um, beautiful uh, to find, to feel our last bit of warm weather for the... For yeah, the, it was yeah. beautiful weather in, weather in Denver this weekend. Do you yeah. like Mountain Spoon? Um, yeah, I like, I think I like water better than mountains, mm. but... Um, I like them both. That's pretty. That's for sure. Yeah. I grew up going to the beach so much, so I I like the mountains better. I just think they're more relaxing. So, anyways, as I said, we will have full wrap-up coverage for you of Packers versus Broncos on PackersNews.com coming over the next couple of days, and then we will get ready to preview Packers versus Vikings. Guys, get home safe. I'll see you back in Green Bay. Till next time, this has been the Green 19 Podcast from JS Online at Packers News. Bye.